I, I really enjoyed your reference to the Avengers because uh, when they were making the Avengers movie, the studio went to the Pentagon and said, can you support us? And they said, we can't understand how this international organization called S.H.I.E.L.D. will be operating on American territory, so we're not going to support you. And that flummoxed me because if they just walked over to their NATO office in the Pentagon, which of theirs many, uh, and asked them about status of forces agreements and caveats and how does multilateralism work, they would have found good answers like, well, of course, the leadership of S.H.I.E.L.D. is Sam Fury, um, sorry, Sam Jackson, uh, Nick Fury, who is an American. And this is one of the traditional American caveats, which is they always have an American at the top of the chain of command, so that way they can say yes or no to whatever they need to, including whether it means nuking Manhattan. Um, so uh, I actually wrote a blog post about that, and I enjoyed uh, having that out of a footnote in, in a book I'm going to refer to. Um, I'm really glad to be here because Kingston has been my home away from home ever since I've moved to Canada. Uh, this is my fourth or fifth KCIS. Uh, and this is the first one in which uh, an organization which I've helped to build called the Canadian Defense and Security Network is present and supporting it. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to be uh, amplifying the event in the weeks to come with the podcast that Stephanie and I are working on. We've been interviewing uh, several of the participants. Um, and so it's really very, I'm very happy to be here because I can actually see the fruits of our labor that we've been working on for something like five or seven years. We can actually see our banner and we could see our knowledge mobilization co uh, coordinator in the background, uh, Melissa, helping to organize uh, our podcast. And it's actually real. So this is very exciting for, for us. Um, what I want to do in my few minutes of hasty presentation, since I'm a, a, a last minute add on, is, is talk a little bit about um, the domestic politics of all of this. Uh, and the domestic politics of all of this across the alliance is not just about whether the youth, those pesky youths are uh, ignorant or not, but about the basic dynamics of, of, of domestic politics across the world's democracies, particularly the NATO's democracies. And it starts with a, a fundamental uh, understanding of the reality of NATO, which people get wrong. There is nothing automatic about anything in NATO. The Article 5 has to be invoked. It just that attack upon one equals attack upon all has to be agreed that there is an attack. So if somebody drops a few bombs in Turkey, is that an attack? If somebody uh, engages in a cyber attack against Estonia, is that an attack? Well, you get, have to get consensus to agree to that. And once you get that consensus, it doesn't mean everybody does everything they can or everything the SACUR wants them to do in response to this. Countries opt in or opt out of entire missions, entire operations, or of specific efforts. Um, and that has to be the way, because all these democracies are not going to surrender control of their militaries when they're engaged in multilateral military op operations, or else most of them would never have civilian control of the militaries, because most of them, including Canada, never operate alone. Uh, and also, all these missions have deep political consequences, successful or when they're failed. And so no politicians are going to say, oh, you guys do what you want with our troops. We don't care how many you end up getting killed in, in failed uh, efforts. So there will always be caveats, always be restrictions, always be somebody with the potential to hold up a red card saying, no, we will not do this. Um, the question then becomes, what shapes those decisions? Uh, and what shapes those decisions are not what happens in Brussels, but what happens in Paris, Berlin, Copenhagen, Ottawa, Washington, D.C., and so forth, which makes it a more interesting research project because while the beer in Belgium is very good, researching this project led me all over uh, Europe and even off to Australia since they were a partner and we had to understand whether partners behave the same way as members, and in this respect, uh, even more so. Um, and so then the question is, what matters in domestic politics? And the basic reality is, is that in any domestic political system where there are coalitions or minority governments, Politicians are going to have to ask for support. There are always going to be somebody who's more enthusiastic about the mission and somebody who's less enthusiastic about the mission. And then there has to be a bargaining process between the two. And the more distance there is between those two sides, then the more restrictions that ultimately get imposed. Or the more parties you have to add on to get to that support, you'll have to impose more restrictions and make things more complicated. And sometimes that means countries opt out either entirely or mostly. And that will lead to restrictions such as we will not fight in the southern part of Afghanistan, or we will not drop bombs on Libya, 
we'll fly over Libya for as long as you want us to, but we're not going to drop any bombs. Um, and so you can go from mission to mission to mission and see how these things play out. And why I raise this is because things have gotten very complicated. During the post-Cold War period, which we can call 1991-ish to 2014-ish maybe, um, or maybe 2008, this play, the NATO really empowered politicians in certain ways, that to be a legitimate party that was capable of being a mainstream party that could govern in a coalition, you had to be NATO compliant. You had to be a party that supported the existence of NATO. You had to be a party that didn't oppose, that was opposed to neutrality. And so the, the inheritors of the communist parties and also the green parties of Europe, and I would also suggest the NDP in here, had to shift their stances on NATO if they wanted to be seen as a credible party, which made it easier to operate with NATO. And so you saw, for instance, the NDP vote several times to support the Libya mission uh, after having a long history of being hostile to, to NATO endeavors. So that was, that was the heyday of, of NATO in some ways. What's changed since then is we've had the rise of far left and far right parties, mostly abetted by the Russians, who have stances that are opposed to NATO. They're opposed to all multilateralism, and most of their animus is dedicated towards being anti-EU, but m much of it is also dedicated to being anti-NATO. And thus far, these parties have not served in coalitions, and so we have enough to worry about how to get their support in order for, NATO, for that country to support a NATO operation. But if the AFD in Germany were to get into power, this would be a problem. If the left party in Germany was, uh, was, would get into power, it'd be hard for Germany to act. It's always hard to get Germany to act anyway. Uh, and you can think across the alliance, there's all these other populist parties of the far left and the far right that have as one of their stances being hostile to NATO. Partly because NATO is affiliated with the United States and this is part of an anti-Americanism that is rising or has always been sort of on the far left and the far right. So there's this basic dynamic that's going on there and it makes things harder. There's a second dynamic, which is what about the mainstream parties? Well, one of the things, the things about mainstream parties is it does depend on attitudes about the United States. That their ability to negotiate over engaging in, in a NATO operation or even a, an ad hoc operation is about attitudes towards the United States. So in the aftermath of the Iraq war in 2003, when George Bush would go to Europe and say, could you help us more in Afghanistan? It was very hard for European leaders to say yes because they didn't want to stand next to George Bush. They didn't want to be seen as helping George Bush. And so, for instance, um, Jacques Chirac was not going to do anything visible to help the Americans in Afghanistan beyond what he already was doing. So there was actually a very invisible special operations effort that was very helpful by the French and a very present but not very helpful French effort in Kabul at the time, which wasn't doing much. Uh, and it took uh, both the leadership change in Paris and in Washington to really turn France around into being a very helpful ally in Afghanistan. And we saw when Obama became president, attitudes in Europe changed because Obama was the opposite of George Bush in terms of the popularity. He was uh, lionized, very popular. Uh, politicians wanted to be uh, seen in pictures standing next to him. And so it made it easier for politicians to make decisions that were supportive of the United States and of its efforts. So when Obama had the surge into Afghanistan, this is something that the Europeans could support. I'm always reminded of this when I walk around the Bywood Market in Ottawa because there's you know, the one place where Obama bought a cookie and there's still pictures of him buying that cookie because they love Obama. And in fact, Obama was just in Ottawa a couple of weeks ago giving a talk. And of course, there's now pictures spattered all over the news of, of Obama and the Prime Minister of Canada having a beer at the Big Rig. Uh, because again, Obama is still widely popular and it's good for politicians to be seen with a widely popular former American leader. And this contrasts very sharply with the outbidding process that's going on in European countries today to be seen as distant from the current President of the United States because Donald Trump is widely reviled in Europe. And so it makes it harder for countries that might want to help the United States to do so when it's seen as caving in to Donald Trump, particularly when he blusters and bluffs and makes threats and launches trade wars with his allies. 
yes, Canada no longer has aluminum and, and, and steel tariffs on, on our goods going into the United States. This is not true for the Europeans. So there is still an ongoing trade war between Europe and the United States, uh, which makes it very hard then for countries to cooperate. Uh, and given that the U.S. has often been the engine of getting NATO to do something, it makes things very difficult for NATO to do things. Uh, and it's also complicated by the fact that most of the desks in the State Department that are responsible for NATO are still understaffed, that when Europe calls the State Department, the phone just rings. And so a lot of the peop key people who would be pushing NATO to have initiatives at, at the summits uh, just aren't there. So that's a challenge. The good news is in terms of some of the stuff that Mark was talking about, the deterrence mission in the Baltics is somewhat immune to this in the short term because we know that if there were to be a Russian attack in the Baltics, the NATO countries there would fight. Even the Germans, we often criticize for these things. Uh, I was in Berlin a couple weeks ago and got clearer on the rules. And the rules are they don't need a vote from the Bundestag in order to fight in Lithuania. It's within NATO territory. You don't need to get through Parliament to do that. So there aren't much in the way of restrictions. If the attack comes, they would fight, and they wouldn't need to call home. And that's, that's, that's huge, because in part, the, the Russians will be trying to disrupt all efforts to call home. So if the balloon goes up and war starts, NATO will operate as we expected to do so in the Baltics. The challenge is, in the medium to long run, whether anti-NATO parties become governing parties, in which case they might decide to pull troops out of the Baltics, and that would then harm the deterrent situation. So that's where we stand right now. Uh, and what really matters, strangely enough, for NATO's future are elections. Elections in Washington, in the United States in 2020, because the question is often asked, okay, can we handle four years of Trump? Can we handle eight? Uh, elections in Europe about, uh, over the next you know, four, six, eight years about who, which of these far left and far right parties come into power. Remember France, it was the, Le Pen did very well in the first round and it took all the rest of the French political system to line up against Macron, well almost the entire system. And so the question then is in future elections, will the far right win in, in these countries? I'm not really actually that worried about uh, about some of the countries, but we already have other countries in Europe already going so far. You know, we don't really care that much about that Hungary has gone authoritarian because nobody counted on Hungary to do anything anyway. The New Zealanders actually patrolled in Hungarian territory in, in, in Afghanistan because they knew the Hungarians wouldn't do it. Um, we never counted on them. The fact that, that uh, Turkey has slid into authoritarianism has been really problematic because it's sort of a, a cornerstone of that part. It's a key uh, bridge to uh, the Middle East. But it was never the fun, one of the fundamental members. It's so, it's the question really is about the British, the French, the Germans, maybe the Italians. And of course, the Italians have started to include far right parties in their coalitions, and the United States. So the real question is, is what are we doing to protect our elections? And what are we doing to have our parties uh, that are more mainstream be more successful? The good news about those darn millennials is they are actually far less far right and far left than us old folks. Blame the old folks for Brexit, not the youth. Blame the old folks for Donald Trump, not the kids. Uh, and so there I will close with some optimism, which is the folks, the vo voters who are dying uh, are the ones who are the problems. And the folks who are now increasingly voting are voting for reasonable policies and for reasonable parties. So the future is actually kind of bright if we can get there. <laughs>